Right now, I ask is as we bring forth your word, Father, as we open up Revelation and we look at how you are redeeming the world, that you are redeeming your people, and that you are making all things new, that you would just penetrate our hearts and our minds and our souls during this time. As we look at your word, help us to come back better for it. It is in your name that we pray all of these things. Amen. Amen. If you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn to Revelation chapter 19. Revelation chapter 19. Uh, we're only going to do the first 10 verses of Revelation chapter 19 today. It's been a while since uh, we've been in Revelation, about two weeks. And then it was two weeks before that because of the weather. So we've been kind of in and out. But I'll just tell you where we are right now. Uh, the last three or four weeks that we have been in Revelation, we have been looking at a tale of two cities. We've been looking at Babylon that represents the evil of the world, the evil structures of the world. It is a man-made structure, Babylon is, this worldly system of government and doing things that are ultimately going to end in our destruction because anything we do is less than what God can do. So Babylon is going to represent all that is evil, all that is wrong with the world. Yet tonight, in the next couple of weeks though, we're going to be looking at the tale of another city, the Jerusalem, the new Jerusalem that will be coming out of heaven, that God will be making all things new, wiping every tear from our eye, there will be no more hunger, no more pain, no more death, those former things have passed away, and God is redeeming not only man, but that shalom or that peace that was in the world before the fall. So, Revelation is not just about a tale of two cities. It's also a tale of two women. It is the prostitute that lives in Babylon that is really deceiving the whole world. Come and love me. Come and lay with me. Come and commit idolatry with me. And, and have this false sense of comfort. But then you also have in Jerusalem another woman. It is the bride. The bride of Christ that Christ will adorn. And that bride is His church, His people, His redeemed. Revelation, all of the Bible, is about God redeeming everything that man lost through sin. Now, God didn't do anything to, to lose man. God did not commit any sin. We lost everything. We lost shalom with God. We lost relationship with God. We lost uh, eternal life with God. And from Genesis, the time the sin is entered the world, all throughout the scripture, God is redeeming everything that you and I have lost. This is what makes him a gracious savior. That Israel finds himself in, in Egypt and in slavery. God redeems them through Moses. They find themselves in Babylon, and God redeems them through Ezra and Nehemiah and Isaiah and Ezekiel. Did you catch the latter part of your Sunday school lesson this week? We were in 2 Chronicles, and Solomon is de dedicating the temple to the Lord. And this wasn't in our Sunday school lesson, but he's dedicating the temple to the Lord, talking about God's faithfulness and his forgiveness and how a temple built with human hands could not really hold him because we can't put God in a box. But he goes on to say this, Lord, I know that we are all sinners. And then one day we we're going to sin so badly that you're going to allow our enemies to come into our land and to take us into their land and to make us slaves. But when we cry out to you and when we pray to you, will you forgive us? Will you send someone to redeem us? Will you bring us back to this temple? And years later, when they had sinned, and the Babylonians came and sacked Rome and destroyed the temple, they were enslaved for 70 years, and they prayed, and they cried to God, and God did redeem them, answering Solomon's prayer to bring them back to the temple. So it's not just a tale of two cities, Babylon and Jerusalem. It's a tale of two women. It is this tale of the prostitute, and it's the tale of the bride of Christ. And it's crucial in this life to determine which woman that we're going to follow and what city we're going to live in. Will we live in Babylon and have this false security of, that Babylon offers with the prostitutes, or will we live in the New Jerusalem with our groom as the bride of Christ? Babylon offers a false insecurity we looked at. We, really, all of us are one, one phone call away, one, one disaster in our day away, 
from being totally devastated. One job loss, one sickness, uh, one, one marriage falling apart, one child dying, that we are all just moments away from this utter devastation, yet we live like we are not because we're putting our hope in Babylon. The first thing I do when I get up in the morning as I look at the news, I don't like to watch the news through the day. I don't watch it at night. Uh, it just gets depressing. But I like to look at the news early in the morning as I'm, I'm getting ready for my day and I'm scrolling through my phone. And I see a devastating story. And this hit me all of a sudden. That Stephen Hawking died this morning. And a lot of Christians who don't get it go, well, he didn't believe in God. I bet he believes now. Which means that you really don't get how devastating it is. Stephen Hawking was a brilliant, brilliant man. Uh, at 21 years old, he came down with a disease, the Lou Gehrig's disease, where the muscles just are not working anymore and you need help breathing. I, they gave him two years to live when he was 21 years old. He lived 55 years on this earth more after he got sick. He explored the universe, had great insights about what, what black holes were and, and brilliant man. He wrote a book called The Theory of Everything that sold 10 million copies. But Stephen Hawking would <coughs> over and over again say he did not believe in God. And as I read that story that he had died the day of 76, I felt the sting of death. I felt the sting of death because he saw great insight about the universe, but he never saw the God of the universe. Then he spent this, this whole most of his life here on the earth, from 21 on, dealing with this debilitating disease that would eventually take his life. He lived a life of suffering, and he died and never was healed. Even on this side of eternity, never was healed. And I felt the sting of death this morning as I woke up and began to read my news feed thinking, if the Holy Spirit did not do something just radical in his life in the last few hours, this man was never healed. This man put his hope in Babylon, his hope in the universe. The same hope of the universe are the same things that God is using to destroy the earth in tribulation. He's using the heat of the sun. He's throwing hailstones from heaven. He did that wormwood and other stuff is coming from outer space to destroy earth. And these are the things he put his hope in. And yet, those things did not save him in the end. And he's still not saved because of Babylon and following the prostitute. This world gives us a false sense of security. And a brilliant man who lived on this earth is in hell today because what Paul said, that the wisdom of this world is what? Foolishness to God. Foolishness to those who are perishing. So I, even today, I was getting ready for my message, and I was really kind of distracted on YouTube looking at Stephen Hawking interviews and what he said about God and, and, and really just feeling the devastation of the sting of death in his life. That I wish that he could have been healed. I wish he could have gone to the New Jerusalem, this, this other city where there is no pain, there is no sickness, there is no death, there is no crime, there is no suffering, where every, all the old things of Babylon and the prostitute and all that she was offering have passed away. And everything that God is doing is making us new. We will never hunger, we will never thirst, we will never know any of those former things ever again. And so we ended last week with the destruction of Babylon. That no one will marry anymore and no one will fall in love. That means that no one will, you will not repopulate Babylon because no one is getting married and no one is falling in love and no one is having children. It has utterly destroyed this world. There are no more craftsmen to be found, no more carpenters to be found. That Babylon will not be rebuilt. That when God destroys this earth, as we've been looking at in tribulation, through the seal judgments and the trumpet judgments and the bold judgments, that this earth will remain destroyed. And not only this earth, but the sun and the moon and the distant galaxies and all the things that, that uh, Stephen Hawking spent his life putting his hope in will be destroyed. And the only thing that will last forever is the bride of Christ. The true bride of Christ. When the prostitute is dead and she is smoking, that the bride of Christ will be alive. And so Revelation chapter 19 is going to say, okay, the world is ended. Hallelujah. 
And we're going to see four hallelujahs. Hallelujah because his judgments are true. Hallelujah because Babylon smokes forever, never to rise again. Hallelujah, we can focus on the worship of God without distraction. And hallelujah, he reigns forever. Just a quick trivia note, by the way. This is, in chapter 19, is the only time in the New Testament the word hallelujah is mentioned. Right here in heaven. When the world is ended, when Babylon is gone, when the prostitute is dead, we can say hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Let's read Revelation chapter 19, 1 through 5. After these things, I heard something like a loud voice of a great multitude in heaven saying, Hallelujah, salvation and glory and power belong to our God because his judgments are true and righteous. For he has judged the great harlot who was corrupting the earth with her immorality and he has avenged the blood of his bondservants on her. And a second time they said, Hallelujah, her smoke rises up forever and ever. And the 24 elders and the four living creatures fell down and worshiped God who sits on the throne saying, Amen, hallelujah. And a voice came out of the throne saying, Give praise to our God, all of you, his bondservants, who fear him, the small and the great. Now who is this multitude saying hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah? Well, we know that some of these are the 24 elders and the four creatures that we saw before the throne in Revelation chapter 1. These who worship before the throne day and night. We believe that these are the angels but I believe this is the bride of Christ. That everyone who will live in the new Jerusalem, everyone who has been redeemed from the curse, everyone who has been redeemed from this world will be saying hallelujah to God, worshiping the God who has destroyed the evil things in this world and who has taken us out of corruption. That we are corrupted because of this world. That we feel Babylon. That we are attracted to the prostitute. But God is even redeeming us from all of those things. One of my favorite writers and preachers in, in today's world is John Piper. And here is something he says in his book called Worship God. If God turned a deaf ear to sin and evil and injustice and suffering in this world, he would not be true. And he would certainly not be just. God is rightly and wholeheartedly praised for his justice. These hallelujahs. Popper goes on to say this. Corporate worship, what you and I are doing right now as we meet together as the gathering believers, what we will do Sunday morning in worship, not just the singing of songs, but the proclamation of the word through our offerings as we meet together. Corporate worship is the declaration in the midst of Babylon, this world, that we will not be drawn into her holotries, her prostitution, because we have found in God satisfaction of our souls. In his presence is fullness of joy, and at his right hand are pleasures forevermore. Corporate worship is the pu public savoring of the worth of God, and the beauty of God, and the power of God, and the wisdom of God. And therefore, worship is an open declaration to the prostitute and in our hearts, and our bodies, that we will not be drawn into the allurements of this world. Though we may live in Babylon, we will not be held captive by Babylonian ways. And we will celebrate with all of our might the awesome truth that we are free from that which will be destroyed. That we are free from that which will be destroyed. That's what we... That's why we meet in church. That's why we come together on Sunday mornings and Wednesday nights and we meet in home groups. Yeah, we can be at home, but we come and we worship the, the, the worth of God, that He is our treasure, that He is our satisfaction. And when we come into this room, we are turning our backs on Babylon saying, no, this is better. This is better. Last time we were together in the fellowship hall, I said, is it possible to live a godly lives in Babylon? And I said, of course. Daniel did it. Shadrach did it. Meshach did it. Abednego did it. Uh, we see that it, you can live like this in Babylon. We see that Nehemiah did it. And Ezra did it. And Isaiah did it. We can be set apart. We can be holy even in Babylon. So we see these three hallelujahs. That God is just. That, this, that Babylon is gone forever. Hallelujah. We can focus on the worship of God. Hallelujah. He reigns forever. Look at this now. This woman, not the prostitute, but the bride. Verse 6. 
Then I heard something like the voice of a great multitude, and like the sound of many waters, and like the sound of mighty peals of thunder, saying, Hallelujah, for the Lord our God, the Almighty, reigns. The Almighty is going to mean that He is control of everything. Verse 7, Let us rejoice and be glad and give glory to Him, for the marriage of the Lamb has come, and His bride has made herself ready. It was given to her to clothe herself with fine linen, bright and clean, for the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. Now, the praise now shifts for what God has done to Babylon. All right, He has destroyed Babylon. Hallelujah. He's destroyed the prostitute. Hallelujah. His justice is good. Hallelujah. And now we have this hallelujah that God reigns in heaven, and our focus in heaven now shifts from the earth, and what God did on the earth by redeeming us from it, and now the, the, the glory and the hallelujahs shift to heaven. And we see this bride who has been, had been adorned for her husband. We see this burning of Babylon, but we also see this celebration, this wedding feast of the Lamb. Historical marriages in the Jewish day were different than what we have today. There's usually two parts in our, in our kind of... Uh, courtship today as we think about getting married. You have an engagement period. Now, some people just spend a lot of time being engaged. They never get married. All right? Uh, we're going to live together and we're going to not make any kind of covenants or anything like that, but we're just going to be engaged for a long time. Now, I'm a Christian. Shelby and I were engaged on January 1st, 2012. We were married May 5th, 2012. All right? We wanted to be in covenant as soon as possible. Okay? We didn't want a long engagement. So we have this, in, in America, we have this engagement period, and then you have the wedding ceremony. In Jesus' day, you would have a time of betrothal, all right, where you were betrothed to somebody. There was sometimes an arranged marriage, but you, once you were betrothed to somebody, you were under contract with them, and it was like you were married, but you weren't living together. Make sense? And so you were married, so this is why... Mary lived over here, and Joseph lived over here, and she became pregnant, and even though they weren't married, Joseph still had to divorce her if he wanted to get out of the relationship, okay? Because when you were betrothed to somebody, it was like you were married. And in a Jewish ceremony, what would happen in a wedding is the groom would go to the bride's home and get her, pick her up, and then he would bring her to his home for the wedding <coughs> feast. You see this kind of Jewish ceremony going on right here in Revelation chapter 19. You and I, right now, as we live on the earth as born-again Christians, called by God by special election, are betrothed to God. We are espoused to God here on the earth. That means that everything that comes with our marriage with God, faithfulness, we are to be on this earth. But one day, one day, our bridegroom, Jesus Christ, is going to come to our house, Babylon, and he's going to pull us out of here, and he's going to take us to his house, and we're going to eat. We're going to eat. We're going to celebrate. We are going to be with him. And so right now, you and I are espoused to Christ, betrothed to Christ, and that carries with it the contract of faithfulness. But he will come for his bride, and he will get his bride, and he will take him with him. Let us with him to heaven, that new Jerusalem, to enjoy the wedding feast. The analogy is so pointed here in our church. It says, and the bride makes herself ready for the groom. This is what we're doing right now, right? This is why we're here right now. This is why we're studying the Bible. This is why we sing. This is why we go to women's retreats and home groups on a Sunday night. And we meet for women's Bible study. We meet for Sunday school. And we read our Bible in the morning. And we pray with our kids. And we pray with our wife. And we go to work. And we try to live good Christian lives. It's so that we can make ourselves ready for the groom. The bride is making herself ready. I believe Phil, our evangelist, spoke about this all week long. That Christianity is not a moral pursuit but we pursue morality and the fruits of the Spirit that we might make ourselves ready for our groom. There are things I do for Shelby that I don't do for anybody else. And there are things you do for your wife or your husband that you won't do for anybody else. And there are things I'll do for the Lord that I will not do for anyone else. Come to remain faithful to the Lord. And so how does the bride make herself ready? 
I think Revelation answers this in about four ways, all through Revelation, and some of the stuff we've already studied. The bride makes herself ready by doing this, by remaining faithful to Christ in a fallen and evil world. That you and I live in Babylon, and we can be corrupted by Babylon. That you and I turn on the TV, and we are corrupted. You and I turn on the radio, and we are corrupted. We go to the grocery store, and we feel the corruption of this place. But if your eyes cause you to stumble, if your hand causes you to stumble, throw it far from you. That you might enter the kingdom of God whole. And so you and I remain faithful to Christ in a fallen world. Number two, by enduring hardship in the midst of suffering. Jesus said that in this world you will have trouble. But take heart, I have overcome this world. I love that Jesus says that when something happens to you and you begin to suffer, don't suffer as if something strange is happening to you at all. Nothing strange is happening to you. You live in a corrupt <coughs> world. You live in a world that will be destroyed. And sometimes you will feel the suffering of this world. But even in the midst of suffering and hardship, remain faithful to God. Number three, we will get ourselves ready by trusting God even in the face of martyrdom or our own death for the sake of the gospel. That you and I live in a, I've said this before, in a unique time. That as Americans... We don't have any natural enemies, you know, to Christianity. Our government is for us. They're not going to bust in the door down here, okay? We have constitutional freedoms, uh, but in other parts of the country, that's not, or world, that's not the case. In Honduras, where, where Phil came from, or Cambodia, where uh, Alf came from Saturday night, that there are some places in the world where you do not have religious freedoms that you can put you put in jail. In fact, all through Scripture we see that the church is scattered in Acts after Paul kills Stephen uh, to the ends of the earth because of, of, of martyrdom and, and Christian persecution. And so even in the midst of, of our death, remain faithful to Christ. We get ourselves ready by the fourth way. By obeying God and taking the gospel to every tribe, every tongue, and every nation. We looked at every tribe and every tongue and every nation this week. We had a missionary preaching our, our revival. We had a man come and lead worship Sorry, not. He went to Cambodia with his family. And this week, this month until Easter, uh, we're doing an offering. We're doing the Annie Armstrong offering to support missionaries. And the thing I came away with Saturday night is over support your missionaries. So that they can go to the ends of the earth and teach the, every tribe, tongue, and nation. You may not be a missionary, and I may never be a missionary. But we can support the work of missionaries. And this is how the bride gets herself ready for the groom. By supporting the church and supporting the gospel going out. Let's finish up. Revelation chapter 8, or chapter 19, 9 and 10. Then he said to me, Write, Blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, These are true words. And then I fell to his feet and to worship him. But he said, Do not worship me. Do not do that. I am a fellow servant of yours and your brethren who hold the testimony of Jesus. Worship God. For the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Look at Philippians 2. 12 through 13, right behind me. It says this, So then, my beloved, just as you have always obeyed, not all as only in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. But look at verse 13. For it is God who is at work in you, both to will and to work his good pleasure. This is how the Lord is getting his bride ready. There's a word here I want you to underline in your Bible. In verse 9. Then he said to me, Right blessed are those who are invited, invited, underline that, to the marriage supper of the Lamb. You know you have to be invited, right? You know you have to be invited by Jesus Christ. Um, There's another man who died recently, and it's not Tim Hawkins. It's a man that uh, is the total opposite of Tim Hawkins. <laughs> Stephen Hawkins. <laughs> Stephen Hawkins. Tim Hawkins is a Christian comedian. <laughs> okay? But Billy Graham died recently. And when I heard he died and I read that story, I did not feel the sting of death. 
I felt that little rejoicing in my heart because, yeah, he was in a wheelchair too at the end of his life. And I believe even today that he is walking the streets of glory because he is invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. I say all that to say this. Billy Graham was famous in his crusades for saying this. If God is calling you right now, you better move because the Spirit will not always invite you. If God is calling you to do something, is He calling you to walk the aisle or to get baptized or to do something for Him, you'd better respond to when God invites you to do something because He may not invite you tomorrow. Because the Spirit of God is not always moving in your life. And just because you say, I'll get saved then, doesn't mean that you'll get saved then. Doesn't mean you'll be invited then. And when the Spirit of God is moving, you better make your way down the aisle. I can't tell you how many times I've watched one of his sermons where he said, you better move if God is calling, if God is inviting, because he may not invite you Sunday. He may not invite you next Wednesday. He may not invite you at the next Billy Grand Crusade. You better come now, because if God is moving and God is doing the inviting, you better respond. And so this word that says, all who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb, means that God is the one doing the initiating. God is the one doing the inviting. That we have no say in our salvation. That God owns the whole thing. And so God is worthy of glory, honor, and praise. Because he is the one who has decided, I will invite you. That's grace. That's grace all day long. I did nothing to earn being invited. I did nothing to earn this dinner. I did nothing to earn this groom. I did nothing to earn heaven. I did nothing. Except I was invited. And I, I checked yes. I check yes. You and you are invited and you check yes. There are many people in this world who will be invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb and they will check decline. Decline. Then you have to be invited. And they said these words are faithful and true. And then John says, begin to worship the angel. And if the revelation is anything, it's, it's worship God. And this angel kind of brings it to full circle real quick. Says, don't worship me. I'm a fellow servant. Don't worship the angels. Don't worship Babylon. Don't worship the prostitute. Don't worship the idols. Worship God. Don't worship your money. Don't worship your wife. Don't worship your kids or your cars or your job. Worship God. Don't worship your pastor or your church or the people in your Sunday school class. Worship God. The, the message of Revelation, the message of the Bible, what he's been trying to hammer into our heads from Genesis to Revelation is stop <coughs> worshiping Babylon and the things of Babylon. Don't even worship the angels. Don't worship Mary. Don't worship the rosary. Worship God. This is the message of the Bible. And he's inviting you to become part of the marriage supper of the Lamb so that for eternity, you and I might worship God. The, these former things, this world is passing away. It's done. We're not going to talk about this world anymore. The next couple of weeks, Jerusalem. God will as we finish up Revelation. Would you stand with me? Father in heaven, we thank you so much for the study that you are making all things new. You are redeeming this world. You're redeeming us from all the corruption that our eyes have seen. Redeeming us from all the corruption, Lord, that that our, our legs have walked into and that are sometimes our voice has spoken. Lord, thank you so much for the cross. Lord, that we were enemies of God, yet you have made us friends of God. Father, that we were slaves to Babylon, but you make us free in Jerusalem. That we were beholden and owned by the prostitute, but you have set us free that we might be the bride of Christ. Let us live faithful lives here on the earth as we await our bridegroom to come and get us and to take us to the supper of the Lamb. Lord, just move this time of invitation and we ask all these things in your precious and holy name. Amen.